Hello and welcome to today's webinar organised by The Pathologist and Ulterview. I'm Olivia Gaskill, Associate Editor of The Pathologist, and I'm excited to be moderating today's webinar in which we'll explore multidimensional multiplexing for investigating spatially resolved immune tumour heterogeneity. Please allow me to introduce today's speaker, Ralph Huss. Ralph is Professor and Deputy Director of Pathology and Molecular Diagnostics at the University Hospital in Augsburg, Germany, where he also leads the Centre for Digital Medicine. He is board certified in anatomical, experimental and molecular pathology, with more than 30 years of experience in histopathology, in immunology, cancer research and oncology. During the webinar, he'll explore the utility of advanced analysis and artificial intelligence tools for uncovering the complexity of spatial and immunological heterogeneity in tumour tissue. Ralph will be on hand to answer any questions that you may have at the end of the presentation, but please remember that you can submit questions at any time throughout the webinar, and there'll also be polls at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session. Okay, so without further ado, let's get on with today's webinar. Ralph, over to you. Thank you very much, Oliver. Olivia, I think, uh, I hope that you can hear me well. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and, and present um, our, our view on um, multiplexing and uh, for the um, discovery and analysis of tissue heterogeneity. I hope that I can stay live during the entire session. As a pathologist, usually I sit in the basement of a hospital with big around me and uh, so that gives sometimes a little problems with, uh, with the digital connections, but let's keep our fingers crossed. So um, first, a, a short disclaimer. Um, I have been a former employee of AstraZeneca and uh, still holding some, some shares. The most of the work that I will, or some of the work that I will present today was been executed, has been executed under the patronage of AstraZeneca. And most of it is summarized in a book that we published some years ago that uh, deals with the what we call tissue phenomics profiling cancer patients for treatment decisions. So when, our, when we talk about tumor heterogeneity and making appropriate decisions for uh, the patients, there are a, a wide variety of uh, possible factors that we need to take into consideration. There are and, uh, quite, as I said, quite a number of, of also biomarkers that gives us insight into the individual tumor and the genetic and epigenetic background of, of a single tumor, but also in the environment where a tumor eventually grows, where it metastasizes to. As you see here from a, from a recent publication, this is a way how the patient and the tumor interacts in its environment, being influenced by all these different factors of which some are even of environmental nature, and as you know, there's currently a lot of discussion on the microbiome and other factors that we use to, to or that used to change during our daily life when we get up in the morning or when we, uh, when we have our first coffee, when we get under stress, when we go to work and when we go to sleep at night. That all changes our, our overall personal environment. And of course, it takes influence in the immune system and how we eventually will fight cancer or fight any disease in our body. So I think most of, of you who, are, who deal with, with cancer and uh, cancer development have still this picture from Chan and Melman in their mind that was published in Immunity in 2013, trying to identify all these different stages of, of uh, cancer development and the possibilities how to interfere with the progression and the development of cancer. So even looking at this is provide or give, gives us a quite a substantial number of potential factors that we can try to, to block or to enhance to reach a homostasis of, of, of cancer growth and the immune system. And of course, it's not that easy anymore to just identify a single factor that we can influence or that we'd like to measure. It's always this measurement of different factors being sometimes independent or interacting factors that play a role in tumor progression in an individual patient. And this was somewhat summarized in a paper by Blank in 2016, published in Science, what they, what they uh, called a cancer immunogram. This radar plot shows some 
into unrelated parameters that um, are those factors that might influence the progression of cancer and that we might want to use also for um, selecting the appropriate treatment. As, we, as you know, we are in the ages of immunotherapy, so there are now an increasing number of immunotherapeutics to unleash the immune system or reinstate the immune response of an individual patient to its growing cancer or metastasizing cancer. So in the end, it's also that what we realize is not only a single immunotherapy that will do the job, it might also require the, the blockage of some kind of activating pathways of some um, tumor driving mutant and really identifying the interaction of those, those different factors. So the question also remains what, as, an, as a practicing oncologist, what should they do first? Should they first give, block the pathway and then increase the immune system or shall we one try to increase the level of neoantigen expression in a certain tumor that would then allow to fire up the immune system to identify the, the uh, tumor cells in the environment. And this is also demonstrated here We're based on an RNA-seq analysis they did in different cancer types. And what you also see on the right side in, the, in this picture, that the overall response to treatment really depending on the composition of the tumor, whether there are just a few immune cells inside the tumor where there was still a neoantigen expression or whether the tumor was not showing any kind of antigen. There is more antigen present required to activate the the T lymphocytes. And as we know, and as we learned over the past years, each tumor is unique. And even if you look at the same tumor with the same conventional histological phenotype, the immune composition may be quite different based on the pretreatment regimen that the patient received in, in what line of treatment the patient is. And of course, we also understand that the presence of a, of a certain driver mutation, for example, a RAS mutation, leads to a quite a different prognosis and a different treatment regimen than if, pay, if those cancers are wild type. We also learned that, for example, looking at the microsatellite instability provides us quite a, a significant biomarker tool to select certain treatments independent of the organ of, of origin. So we are now looking into microsatellite instability, not only in GI cancer, but also in gynecological cancers and other types, because we have realized that the molecular profile also influences the immunostate of those tumors and the responsiveness to checkpoint inhibitors and other immune stimulatory agents. So it's not necessarily the, the tissue of, of or, the tissue of origin of a, of a tumor or where it's it spreads to it during metastasis. It's also the combination of its under, underlying genetic treatment, but also the influencing factor that comes from the outside. And we will see a little bit more of that during this presentation. But of course, my focus of today's presentation is how can we mostly as pathologists, but also as cancer researchers, better understand the immuno, um, the tumor microenvironment and the immune profile just based at looking at the tissue. And, <clears throat> and what tools are necessary to do that? Um, so once again, I mean, um, it's, it's our task to really understand and describe the heterogeneity of an individual tumor. And as you see here in this image, it classifies all the different players in, a, in an image from a, from a tumor tissue with the single expression, for example, of pd one or CD8 or a combination of such. And of course, it's a totally overwhelming task for pathologists to really quantify uh, the, the different cells and understand the functional connectivity of the, um, of the different players in this field. Because it's not only important to identify the presence of those cells, even in a, in a quantitative manner, but also really 
understanding their contextual relationship. And if one, and, and this picture shows a, a possibility how to develop a, a unique profile of each, pa each patient's uh, tumor. When you segment the tumor into different tiles and different areas, so each segment of a tumor gives a, a certain profile and a certain signature. For example, um, with an area that has a dominance of CD8 positive uh, effector cells, while in the tile next to it, you still have the same number of effector cells, but at the same time being controlled with FOXP3 um, regulatory cells with a high expression of PDL1 as a sign of potential exhaustion of those cells. So, of course, this gives you a totally different immune response in the entire tumor. And the entire composition in a single tumor and selecting the appropriate treatment, um, it gives you this kind of colorful um, composition as it's shown in the middle. So, and then it's possible to really identify a typical signature of each individual tumor in an individual patient. So, of course, sometimes it's not possible to do a, a complex multi, multiplex or a, a complete multiplex analysis. So, sometimes it's possible to be, um, a virtual multiplexing to even add different layers of different compositions. It really depends how advanced your lab is and uh, how you, or, or whether you're there, you have already available with certain marker mo uh, molecules. So you can do this kind of virtual uh, multiplexing, do a cell segmentation, and you end up with the same type of density heat map creation as I showed in the previous slide. And then it identifies region of interest that in their composition and number of presence gives you really this typical pattern uh, that is connected or co correlates with a certain line of, of treatment. As I said before, and I hope you still caught this during, during um, me being, unfortunately being outside, I'm sorry, is that it's not only important to understand the presence of this heterogeneity in a single tumor to different tumor origins. We know that signatures might be even identical in different tumor areas. We did this study together with, um, um, with a colleague in, in Portland, Oregon, where we found a signature of macrophages um, combining a, or comparing a mesothelioma with a non-small cell lung cancer patients. In a certain percentage of patients, we even found an identical uh, immune signature based on CDA-positive T cells and macrophages, despite the fact that one of them were clearly a mesothelioma and the other tumor was, or the other tumors were clearly non-small cell lung cancer. So, a unique signatures in each and every patient. However, there are also overlying signatures even in different entities in different tumors. So this is the lesson we need to, need to understand what is the best type of analysis and the best type of signature we can identify and come up with that gives us the best prediction of the possible treatment and also maybe even for the, for the best, for the understanding the prognosis of an individual disease. So as I said before, it's all about signatures, but how to learn about these signatures that are composed out of many different immune cells with many different markers being present or non-present in the, in the, on, on those tumor cells or on these effector cells. How to understand the spatial relationship of those, those cells, whether they do have any role in a single tumor. How to understand whether an effector cells makes a difference, whether it's inside the tumor or outside the tumor in the stroma and still ready to engage. And of course, one solution to come up with these signatures is of course applying artificial intelligence and machine learning respectively, uh, deep learning models. So one can add tile over tile and all these different segments in those tumors, either just based on plain HD, but adding more levels of information from different multiplex analysis 
and adding more markers to that. And so you can build up trees, trees over trees and decision trees over decision trees and, and deep learning networks that generates hypothesis and the tumor might be responsive to a certain treatment and might be the best selection um, for even a treatment combination as I was trying to allude to in the beginning. And first the question is, does any kind of machine learning derived or deep learning derived signature makes any sense? And it's still the task of a pathologist or a cancer expert to validate those signatures in a given scenario and in a given tumor, also based on the previous experience and knowledge that was generated uh, during, during uh, dealing with, with those, those tumors. And one of my favorite examples is in, in this slide here. So when you look to the left, this is a conventional uh, staining of a non-small cell lung cancer and shows you just some brown staining of a given antibody. But when we now, as, we, as I was trying to describe previously, how to add a different information, like different cell types, different expression markers and molecules, and then try to establish a spatial relationship. Then you can visualize the interaction of effector T cells and with target positive cancer cells, but also interacting with regulatory T cells. It's still very difficult to understand what's the meaning of that. If we just see this, this lump of, of, of different cells interacting together, so does this really make sense? And when we take a step back and look at the entire tumor and add layers and layers of analysis also from and validate this through the clinical outcome, and also the prognosis. Maybe we can, come some, we can come up with something on the right. And this is one of my favorite pictures because it shows the same tumors on the right, but now trying to understand the functional relationship of those, those different immune cells. And here we're only looking at three different types. We're looking at effector cells, and we're looking at T-regulatory cells, and we're looking at cancer cells. But when you look into this purple area in this tumor, this is an area where you have a life engagement, an active engagement of T effector cells with tumor cells. This is an area where the, the, the battle, the fight is going on and something that others would call, this is the hot area of a tumor, of a cancer. And then there is this, this greenish area around this. This is an area where there are only tumor cells, but without any engagement of effector T cells. So they are basically ignored by any means of the T cells, whether they are not efficient T cells, whether they are, have some kind of stealth mechanism, we don't know. But this smaller red line around, uh, outside of the, the tumor, these are still T cells to engage. So the question is now, how do we bring in these T cells ready to engage into the tumor cells grow and proliferate in some kind of stealth modus. So this is now the question, how can we identify or select the appropriate drug or drug combination either simultaneously or sequentially to treat the tumor in the best way? So we have to get the tumor cells out of the stealth modus. We have to bring the T cells in and let them and make sure that there are not enough regulatory T cells that inhibit these interactions. So this will be the, the challenge and the future and the task also for multiplexing and uh, for the combination of multiplexing with AI and machine learning tools to really understand that. Because what we'd like to understand as shown here in this diagram that we published just last year is we need to understand these different areas, these different signatures and patterns and fe features in the tumor and in the tumor microenvironment, whether this is an, a hot tumor and a cold tumor. I've never seen a, a tumor that is entirely hot or entirely cold. It's usually, maybe there's more cold tumors than the actual hot tumors because there are areas where there are T cells engaging, but they usually do not flood the entire tumor. And then the question is, are they active? Are they silenced through 
cellular compartments, cellular components like T regulatory cells or soluble factors like, like IDO, like arginase, um, generating these kind of tumors, the smog, and whether they are inside the tumor or outside. Of course, as you know, for those of you who are, who are deep into cancer research and, and um, cancer therapy is that there are many different components that, that play a role. And of course, the presence and the, the expression of neoantigen density has also to do with the genetic activation of certain markers, just referring to the tumor mutational burden. Uh, there seems to be a correlation with it. Of course, driving mutations, how the tumor grow may be irrelevant of the tumor response. And we need to understand what's the dominant factor that needs to be um, attacked in the first hand and where we have time to wait for, for another line of treatment or where we have to act immediately. And this is now the field where multiplexing um, is, has its, its role, its important role, and in the combination with um, AI solutions and machine learning will give us the appropriate signatures. Because what we want to achieve in the end is we would like to, to understand what's the best possible treatment based on the on the uh, composition and in the heat map of an individual tumor. Here is an example of a prostate cancer analysis we did some, some time ago, where we understood this or the spatial relationship of glands and the, the area of the glands with macrophages and immune cells. And just based on this very small or the, the limited number of information we had, we could, at the, in this case at least, show a, quite a different prognostic value just based on those interactions. This was not even about the therapeutic possibilities and any kind of predictive value. So in summary, sorry for that, in summary, multiplexing helps to understand and visualize complex tumor heterogeneity. And it exists basically in each and every tumor. Of course, there are differences in different tumor types and different origins and whether the, the tumor has a, undergone different line of treatments. But nevertheless, multiplexing provides the basis for spatially resolved immune relationships, which are very important to make the right selections and make statements about the prognosis. But it also requires that we need to understand the entire tumor and not only look at little areas that, uh, that gives us just some small parts and small insights. So whole slide imaging and high quality image acquisition are technical requirements to enable adequate image analysis and the application of machine intelligence to really understand these, um, these solutions. And data visualization adds additional in-depth understanding of the prognostic and predictive value of computational signatures. So thank you very much. I apologize for any problems caused by digitization and, and internet connectivity. But uh, I hope you got the message and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, so uh, thank you, uh, Ralph, for your insight into multidimensional multiplexing for investigating spatially resolved immune tumor heterogeneity. Uh, we've received a number of questions from audience members, so we'll try and get through as many as we can in the time remaining. But um, to the audience, please be assured that any questions that aren't answered live today will be answered via email uh, after the event. So the first one is, it's well known that IHC-based biomarker assessment has high inter-observer variability. Can you discuss the variability with multiplexed immunofluorescence and what can the industry do better? Well, that was basically what I was, was trying to emphasize in, in my last summary slide. To really do a robust or just have a robust multiplex analysis and really get all this information, all the previous pre-analytical steps have to be in place. So it's very important that we have a control over standardized tissue processing and, and good uh, image acquisition and, and um, tissue processing because any inconsistency in, the, in the, the processes until we come to the image, until we do the image analysis, will give us 
inconsistent results and lead to a lot of, let's say, question marks instead of answers. Okay, so then the next one is, if I were to design my own panel for immunofluorescence, what are the main considerations I need to take into account? Well, this is a question that we, where we scratched our heads for, for a long time. And when you asked uh, probably 10 different pathologists or cancer researchers, they will give you 11 different answers. What we have seen, and also when we look at the different panels that are available, I think we need to understand the main effector T cell, which has PD or CD8 positivity. We need to understand what are the regulatory T cells. And then, of course, the checkpoint inhibitor access like PD-1, PDL one But what we also learned previously is the fact that macrophages as antigen-presenting cells have a quite a significant role. And they also, as you know, as MDSCs, have a regulatory influence on the tumor. So it's usually these different, these different uh, let's say, effector and inhibitory cell components that we need to, to bring together. But of course, there is a, a huge variety of different markers. We can think of all the different biomarkers and checkpoint molecules like uh, LAC3, TIM1, uh, and, and others that are currently under investigation by different companies and in different <clears throat> academic research groups. Um, and I think it's these different layers of complex complexity that we need to add. And we can only understand this and put them in, in context or relationship by also using machine learning and artificial intelligence. And of course, it requires also big data, big data analysis and good big data, curated big data, cleaned up big data to really make sense of that. Okay, and then um, someone's asked, can you comment on what the best controls are for NESA most companies use tonsil as a positive control, but is this optimal? Well, I'm probably referring to as a control for PDL1, um, which uh, I mean, in tonsils, you have of course the activation of of uh, <coughs> of epithelium, and you also have uh, macrophages and immune effector cells. So any kind of lymphatic tissue gives you some kind of information. Um, but I think it's it's. Again, every tumor is a little bit different. When you think about, um, let's say, pancreatic cancer, there you have a strong fibrosis. You have less uh, immune effector cells. You have more macrophages, like in, in the bladder cancer. So this is a lesson that we still need to learn what's the appropriate control, besides any technical control, of course. So this means that um, you have to make sure that the antibody is working. Um, you have to have the isotypes control, every control you, you do anyway, uh, as someone in the lab. But it really depends on, on what you would like to observe. And unfortunately, we have not had a good solution yet. It really depends on the antibody. And tonsil or any kind of lymphatic tissue is an alternative for effector cells and checkpoint inhibitors. But um, it's not the, the end of the story. Okay, and then someone has a general question about UltraView multiplex fluorescent IHC assays. Uh, they've asked, what, the, what are the quality control measures you implemented or are going to implement covering staining, signal acquisition and image analysis in, it's in an attempt to promote data compar comparability and combinability? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm the wrong addressee for, for this question since I'm not an employee of, of UltraView. So I guess that that um, the, the experts in the AltaView labs and development department uh, should answer this question directly after this meeting. Yeah, no worries. Um, just to uh, Lee, who, uh, who asked that, they will um, answer that directly to you after, as Ralph said. Um, okay, so the next one then is, have you applied multi-omics approaches to better understand tumor immune heterogeneity? Uh, sorry, say this again. Have you applied multi-omics have you applied a multi-omics approach to better understand tumor yeah. immune heterogeneity? Yeah, a very important question, very good question. Um, this is actually the kind of the holy grail of, of uh, understanding tumor heterogeneity. And uh, we did some of those <coughs> uh, experiments, uh, for example, in, in bladder cancer, but also in non-small cell lung cancer. So the question is, uh, so what type of, of 
uh, multi-omics you would add? I think it's important to understand the genetic background of a tumor. This is at least as important to understand the immune composition. So basically the, the, the visual proteomics we see. And then the question is how much multi-omics are you capable to deal with? And it's also important that you feel comfortable with the quality of the data. Um, so when you do an, a, an exon sequencing or a whole genome sequencing, um, are those data relevant? Uh, how, much, how much do you want to weigh into the different information? Um, so the more information you add, the more omics you, you add to this, particularly from, from different uh, technologies, the more the bigger your court has to be, the bigger the data set is, the more you need to analyze. And um, it will come and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we're doing this, uh, but I think this is a challenge for all of us um, to implement this, uh, to make this comparable and um, to also in the end validate this also clinically and, and in the lab, whether this is a, a relevant market combination or not. Or, or not. And it also depends on, the, on the, the available technologies. Okay, great. And then our next question is, how do you perform uh, reproducibility of the high-plex uh, IF assay? Will only verification of high-plex with single color be enough for clinical trials? Uh, can you say the half, last half sentence? Uh, will only verification of high-plex with single color be enough for clinical trials? High plex with single color. This is what I not quite understand. I mean, you get different colors, of course, to to understand or to to visualize the different markers. Maybe I don't understand the the questions. Um, however, to try to answer your question, um, <clears throat> the what what we realized in the past is it is very difficult to convince the regulators on multiplexing uh, when you add more and more information. So the reproducibility, and as you rightly stated, the reproducibility of the standardization um, of those results in the, in the clinical trials is important to convince the, the regulators, of course, um, and the, the uh, authorities, but also our colleagues in the clinics that what we deliver in, in research or in, in, in clinical diagnostic has a value to them. So we really need to be carefully select those, those different markers and really get a very, very strong statement out of these different tumors, whether this is prognose, prognostic or, or uh, predictive. Um, so what we can do in the lab using, for example, there are companies who say that they can generate 700 markers on a single slide. It's, it's nice. It's a great research paper. You probably get nature or science to be interested in what you have done. But before you get into this, into the, and before you bring this into clinical practice, I think we need to start with less. And maybe this was your question. So it's really about going step by step. And I would be very pleased if we would have a, a clinical trial with, let's say, four or five different markers within a contextual relationship. For example, if we could clinically validate what I did show you with the CD8 cells, with FOXP3, with the macrophages and the PD, uh, the, some checkpoint inhibitors on a single slide in a single tumor entity, and then selecting on treatment combination. It was already done. There is some, some evidence from a in molecular melanoma where they did this on the combination of uh, pd one inhibitors and, and CTLR4 inhibitors. Um, so this was done, uh, but again, these were only three markers for two molecules. Okay, and then um, someone's asked, have you any thoughts on adopting multiplexing in the clinic and in geographies of low and middle income countries? What are the barriers to adoption? Uh, I mean, multiplexing per se in, in middle and low developed countries is, is always a matter of the, the, the presence of a lab. Um, if we take a step back and say, you know, what does it mean for, uh, what, um, let's take a step back. I think that digitization will, ha will have a qu quantum leap in middle or low developed countries because 
uh, I think that gives you that gives them an opportunity to accelerate their research and accelerate their um, their insights into tumor biology without going the tedious or for trying to follow the tedious path of pathology what we have done over the past 50 years. As I said before, the robustness of tissue processing um, is is essential and the, the reproducibility to apply multiplexing. But if we are able in it, our attempts to do this to add even a kind of a quality aspect to the multiplexing. So not only the insights onto the spatial relationship, but also the quality aspects saying, oh, if this is present, if they call localized, then we have a good quality of the tissue because it, we know it has to be there by the nature of the disease or the nature of the tissue. So that will definitely add value. Whether multiplexing, high-end multiplexing will be adopted quicker than in, in the rest of the world, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, thanks. And then um, someone's asked the current probability of success of a drug reaching the market from initial research is staggeringly low, only around 3%. Uh, based on what's been discussed during your presentation, can we improve on these statistics? <laughs> yeah, of course, we, we hope so. I mean, uh, as you know, I mean, um, and I have been in biomarker research for the last 15 years at least. And what we have seen a lot of, a lot of failures early on because of we, we did ignore the obvious biology behind that because we only were looking for the single marker. Uh, 15 years ago, we did not have multiplexing at hand. We did not have the tools of machine learning and, and artificial intelligence at hand. So if we have this awareness early on and find the, the right, let's say, combination, I think that we can make an early selection of the, a, a successful drug or drug candidate with a, with a combination of biomarkers much earlier. And we can even rescue some, some, some molecules if they are fail earlier because we do not have the appropriate biomarker composition we do, because we don't understand the relationship. I mean, I've seen so many drugs failing, uh, which now in the, in the aftermath retrospectively, uh, I would say, oh, we could have easily rescued them and because we should have added one A, B and C together without looking just at A, just at B and just at C. So I, yes, I think so. Uh, great, and then someone's asked, what level of scientific val validity do you believe is needed for a successful clinical trial? How good is the evidence today for the association between the biomarker and the clinical condition? Well, I think we all know that, I mean, taking biomarking as, as, a, as a term in general, we know that a high glucose level gives you some information of either on the calorie intake, the sugar intake, or your your your, your status as, as a diabetic patient. Um, so and and also some kind of, of other markers give you give you clear hints. However, I think we need to collect more and more evidence, and I, I think we have to be very stringently um, look at uh, the different opportunities we have. And I think it takes an international effort. It takes a joint effort among experts in the field where we focus on this and, and, and bring in these all these kind of competencies as an interdisciplinary approach. So we need to bring in biomarker experts, oncologists, pathologists, IT experts, machine learning experts, and bring all of that together without not all, don't leave the field to the AI experts. They come up with signatures with an endless number, but clinically meaningless. Let not leave the field only to the biomarker researchers that are coming from a pure biology or medical background. They don't know the opportunities coming from the technical part. So it has, it has to go together, it has to, to, to come together. Um, so, but again, I come back to the, to the importance of uh, standardization and robustness. I think we will see so many or we have seen, unfortunately, so many irreproducible results in different tumors because of, of non-standardized, non-robust tissue processing and different technologies. It, we do not have the robustness of, of molecular genetics and molecular pathology or, or genetic testing at hand in tissue. There's much more inconsistencies and viability with 
hypoxia with with uh, preservation specimens processing in the lab and i think this needs to be standardized and then i'm very confident that we will have the scientific uh, uh, robustness to bring this forward but there's still a lot of work to do but i'm i'm hopeful and optimistic that we can achieve this okay and following on from that um could i uh, Sorry, could AI-based decision systems be classified as CDX? Uh, could these, uh, yeah, could these algorithms essentially be classified as CDX? I think um, maybe many people would argue with me on that one, but I think if this is a a clear, uh, let's say, signature, an algorithm that is applied in combination on a, on a certain tissue with with a certain marker combination. Um, so I think that I'm, I'm very confident that this could be done, um, established as an appropriate IVD. And um, of course, it doesn't mean that it's, it's patentable because as you know, algorithms can be written in many different languages, many different ways. Um, however, but the, the machine-based analysis, let's put it this way, the machine-based analysis of the spatial relationship of, of of uh, defined markers in a certain tumor, in a certain line of treatment, I think this kind of combination needs to be put together as a package. And then I think it can be used as an IVD. Okay, so then um, someone's asked, despite numerous efforts over many years to standardize clinical biomarkers, uh, for example, those used in breast cancer with ER, PR, HER2, they still demonstrate significant interlabor interlab and intralab variability. What can yeah. we do to improve standardization in the field? A very good question. Um, I think it's it's exactly the, the, the problems that the Jess was alluding to, that we have these pre-analytical uh, uh, variabilities. I mean, for example, here in, in my lab, um, I get breast cancer tissue from at least, I would guess, 10 different hospitals. Uh, and um, and and uh, oncologists, so they all take it, they always do, all do it a little bit different, and we try to of course get it standardized. Now think about an international trial. Think about different um, different variables like different fixative, different fixation times, uh, whether it's stored at room temperature or in the fridge. However, I think even with the use of machine intelligence there's also the opportunity to add more quality control along the, um, along the processing. And I think looking at these images, they will give you immediately information about inappropriateness of tissue, inappropriateness of the, the process and the workflow itself. So as, as we move along with adding new signatures and algorithm, we need to also implement quality measures. And uh, this is something, I mean, as a German, I, I, of course, I love to talk about cars. Um, so this was done by the, by the German automotive industry. They started what we call quality by design from the moment they start with the first piece of a car and they start doing the quality measures. So because if you put just the quality at the end, it will never be successful because there will be so many inconsistencies and variables during the, the workflow that it will end with a disaster, end up with a disaster. So you have to control, and we need to control each, every step of the workflow and add maybe machine intelligence by appropriate staining, um, staining qualities, quantification, um, um, invasive cancer versus uh, other compartments. Um, this is also what we need to implement and, and also take lessons from maybe other industry. It doesn't have to be German car industry. There are other areas uh, that are where machine learning is actually applied exactly for that. Okay, and how can multiplex immunofluorescence improve validation of protein biomarkers in tissue when evaluating clinical utility of compounds of interest? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, multiplexing, of course, it, it, I mean, usually what we do is when we look at a slide, we expect certain things to happen. We expect certain markers to be present. And I think it's what we usually do is one, we, we look at one marker at a time. And so Multiplex provides you this opportunity also to see the different coexistence of markers. Um, 
uh, I do quite a significant number of, of teaching of, of pdl one reporting. As you know, for those of you who are active in this field, you know that you have to, to very thoroughly look at, at uh, the membrane staining or the cytoplasmic staining, but you have, or have to look at the entire tumor. And sometimes you have this maybe 1% of staining just in one little piece of the tumor. And there it's very intense. And usually it's at the, at the invasive front and there is a lot of immune cells. So where there are a lot of immune cells, you would expect also a lot of pd one to be unless it's really downregulated. And this is a true pd one negative tumor because for example, pd one is an, is an inducible molecule uh, inducible through soluble factors that are generated by immune cells. For example, TNF alpha interferon gamma. So where there's a lot of factor cells, you see more pd one because the tumor reacts to the factor cells. So this means that the looking at the, the simultaneous events through multiplexing gives you even more insights, not only into the tumor biology, but also into the appropriateness of the assay and maybe the, the, uh, the occurring biology that you would expect. Okay, and someone's asked, please, could you discuss the reliability of results across technology types to allow you to match to your specific study? Uh, this, I mean, as I said before, I mean, there are, it, it really depends what you feel comfortable with in, in your lab and, and what you have established where you have the most experience. Um, so I think multiplexing has the huge advantage of you have everything on a single slide. So you do not depend on on having different sections, you do not, do not need to co-localize that and co-register the different um, the different slides. So, um, I, I mean, we have collected a lot of experience of the different, for example, colors and and uh, visualization dyes that we used over the past. <clears throat> there has been quantum dots twenty years ago. There have been fluores other fluorescent markers. Others are still believe in chromogenic agents. Um, I think we have made huge advantage in the in, in most of the dyes that are provided by by many companies. Um, so it, again, it comes back to the question of standardization, robustness of the assay, and having enough internal quality controls. Great, thank you. And what about practicalities and obstacles in implementing digital pathology into a clinical setting? Well, yeah, this is the, the mother of all questions. Huh. Um, so, of course, it's to start digital pathology. Um, and what we are talking today, what we are talking about uh, multiplexing and machine learning, this is way beyond digital pathology. This is what some people would call computational pathology or, or uh, algorithmic pathology, uh, applying mathematical tools and, and very sophisticated tools. But starting with pathology, with digital pathology in a lab, uh, requires a complete change of your, of your attitude towards managing tissue and uh, also how to follow this workflow. So um, it's not only that you have the digital infrastructure in place, but it's also about the interoperability and interconnectivity of the different devices does your scanner work with the laboratory information system? Are those images retrievable? How do we I report the case? Do I report the case and send it out as a PDF or uh, via a, a direct signal, via email, via mail again? Um, so again, it's about there are solutions and um, I think it's important to start with the with the availability of the, the, the platform technology like scanners, have, but having a good tissue processing in place. Um, if, if the lab is not able to manage consistent tissue, I think you should wait to implement digital pathology until you have solved this problem. But then I think it's straightforward. And uh, the question is how far you wanna go. There are many labs that claim they are fully digital, which is correct, yes. They are not having a single glass slide anymore. They are not using the microscope. 
anymore. So do we, but um, it is. It it takes a while. It takes a, a state of a change in the state of mind. It takes some training of the pathologist because you look at you look at an image on a, on a screen differently as you look at a microscope. And you should have, still have to make sure that you deliver also as a pathologist the same type of quality. But it can be done. Okay, and do you believe that primary diagnoses based on whole slide imaging can safely replace conventional uh, pathologic diagnoses using a microscope? Absolutely. Uh, I think they, I mean, this is just a matter of, of time. Um, I mean, we do this in, in our lab. We still have a microscope available in terms of a disaster recovery plan in case that our, our, our IST system breaks down and we do have a power outage, of course. So this is what we have. We can still report the, uh, the, the cases, but um, given the change of the, uh, the, the, the execution, the performance of the pathologist in the future, um, we will start with reporting cases on the screen, not only the conventional classical HD in some IHCs, but at the same time, we will look at these complex interactions. We will look at the quantification, for example, of biomarkers like ERPR, HER2 uh, on breast cancer, but we will add way more markers. We will get spatial and contextual information to that. The pathologist will become a, a way more or it may not may more importantly, pathology is already important, but we will our role will change as someone who will drive and, and, and add more information out of a single tumor and gives this information to the oncologist. For those of you who are might listening today and they are concerned that they won't have a job in 10 years from now, no worries. You will definitely have a job and you will have more to do than you wish to because the, the, task will be, the task will become more complex. There will be more demands coming along your way, uh, but you will not waste your time on tediously counting colored dots. You will generate information. You will generate information. And these insights you will provide to the, 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 care, the, the primary the cancer care physician and the oncologist. So the role will change, but it will be even more important than it is already at the moment. Great, thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. So we'll go with um, this one. So many in the field believe that the process of scanning to acquire some of the uh, the detailed images might be the most significant aspect of digital pathology. Can you comment on aspects of this and can an actual glass slide image ever be accurate, accurately replicated into a digital image? Um, yes, in, in both instances. Um, so I think that 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 uh, scanning an, an image is one of, is the, the first and important as one of the first or the first and important step of digital pathology. But again, it comes back to the to my iteration of the same claim. You have to control all the processes. And what we see actually is that in some instances, the image on the on the screen is at least as good as in the most. And uh, so um, I, I fully trust um, the, this, this path. And it's just for us, for most of us, it is or it was a matter of getting acquainted with the system. But the, the answer is definitely yes. Sorry, I was on, on mute then trying to speak. Um, well, thank you very much for that. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, again, let me reassure audience members that any questions left unanswered today will be answered after the event by email. Uh, this webinar will also be available on demand in just a few days time, so you'll receive an email alert when the recording's ready. Uh, thank you once again to Ralph for presenting and thank you to our audience as well for sticking with us through um, internet connectivity issues. Um, and thank you for joining us today. It's been great. So um, yeah, I look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you.